Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you for coming. The rain didn't keep you away. I'm so happy. Um, I'm, my name's Kimmy Andrelonis. I'm Managing Director of Betamore. Um, thank you to Whiting Turner for sponsoring this event tonight. And uh, just our awesome collaboration with Chris here um, from ABC Greater Baltimore and the Construction Academy, connecting us with a lot of these amazing panelists here today. We have a very, very cool, in my opinion, um, diverse panel here of all different kinds of aspects of the interest industry, which I'm super excited about. So again, thank you for coming. I'm going to hand it off to Michelle Welly. Hello, and this is our third, third Thursday, and it has rained every single one. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, um, so for our next third Thursday, just bring your umbrella. Um, <laughs> thank you again. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and just a little bit about the organization or company that they're representing, and then I'll start asking them questions. The intent is to, for, for the panel to provide some information um, to kind of encourage you all to think about questions you want to ask them, and I encourage the panelists to ask them each other questions as well. So the topic is, if, if, if you've just stumbled into in here and not have any idea what we're here for, uh, is to really highlight um, innovations that are changing the construction industry. Um, you know, we all, or many people think of technology you know, Betamore and all the organizations that are in that innovation space as for quote unquote tech companies. But what's a tech company? Um, a tech company, frankly, is anybody who's using technology to do anything they need to do. And that's what today's world is. But what we're trying to do with some of our third Thursdays is highlight industries that ordinarily aren't thought of as companies that are that are using technology to, to advance their, their 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 work, their programs, whatever it is. So today we, we have construction. Um, for next, the next third Thursday in March, which is, I guess, March 16th because it's February, um, is highlighting, going to be highlighting manufacturing. So we'll get more information uh, there. So I'll turn it over to you first. Chris is our, our host here. Hey, thanks, Michelle. Um, so I'm Chris Hadfield, Vice President of ABC. Um, it's really great to have everybody here. I'm looking forward to giving everybody a tour. Um, so as soon as we're done, I want to walk everybody around and show you our facility. We're ABC's a trade association. Um, we're uh, political advocacy, membership, and training. Um, we just moved in here about two years ago, and since then we are predominantly training. I mean, our, our training programs have exploded. We train about 3,000 people a year, from apprenticeships to safety to management training. Uh, we're the third largest ABC in the country, uh, and well, we have a board. I see some of our board members here. Uh, the board is actually uh, what kind of spearheaded us being here. So. Um, we were the only ABC that resides within a city limits where it needs to be. This is where a training program needs to be. Um, and you know, that was on purpose. We could have easily chosen a place that was really comfortable for us. Um, we love being here uh, and you know, our programs have just uh, really shot up out the roof since, we, since we've been here. So, uh, and opportunities like this to be able to talk to everybody here. So thank you. I'll pass it on. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Juan Gordon. I'm a project manager with Mahogany. We are a small MBE company here in Baltimore City. We started out doing millwork in 1991 and since have branched out into general construction services, um, commissioning, and construction management. Um, through my time with Mahogany, we've gone from using uh, software like plan grid to using our day-to-day uh, -day pro um, programs uh, called Procore. Uh, Procore has been a monumentous, uh, monumentally changing program for us. Um, we do a lot of our internal meetings within, uh, within Procore. We put a lot of our um, company policies and, and procedures in Procore as well. Um, but when it comes to projects, that's where our bread and butter really happens, right? It tracks our money, it tracks our time for our employees, it tracks the change orders, it tracks the daily uh, daily logs for us as well. And just having the ability to have my superintendent to have a the answers for him immediately within five minutes of having a conversation with a, a an owner saves me time and saves me money and allows us to get the job done quickly. So uh, Procore is, you know, what we drive, what we push. John Sargent, who's hiding in the back right there in the corner, um, has been the, the, the lead liaison for Mahogany um, and pushing Procore throughout the company. So thank you. 
Hello, good evening. Um, I'm Kristen Ernst, Vice President at Whiting Turner. Uh, I oversee our digital construction and technology um, for the East Coast, um, which is a majority for us um, just because we're headquartered here up in Towson. Um, Mahogany was actually my first job at Whiting Turner back in 2004. You all did the train doors on the B&O. Yep. Um, <laughs> on the roundhouse, the roundhouse, yep. So very, uh, no mahogany well. Um, so thanks for having me tonight. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm gonna speak to really, you know, on the GC side, uh, what we're doing um, and how it's just really hard to bring a digital transformation to construction for so many reasons. Um, but I call it job security um, uh, for, for me and people sitting up here um, and, and Steve well. So um, a lot to talk about uh, and I could talk about more about my background here in a minute. Hey all, uh, my name is AJ Valentine. I wear two hats. One is I'm a founder and a co-owner of Cornerstone Remodeling, which is a design build uh, company out of Howard County, uh, specializing in uh, all aspects of higher end residential construction. Uh, but more recently, I founded a new startup, tech startup called Render, uh, which also uh, provides services for the home improvement industry in regards to um, remote engagement, which does not exist yet for this industry. So we're hoping to uh, kind of disrupt this older model of how home improvement sales are done. My name is Steve Montgomery. I am the CEO of Building Point Northeast. Uh, Building Point is a Trimble company. So we focus on technology for vertical construction from the DC um, to Maine, um, working with small, mid, large size contractors, but really um, trying to help position technology um, within, within inside these organizations. Great, thank you. Uh, I think I'm gonna start with, uh, with you, AJ, on, re on re Renner. Am I saying that Renner. right? Renner. Um, could you explain a little bit about what the program is? And I'm interested in, in you explaining how you found, went about, went about finding the technology. You knew what you wanted to do. So how did you find the technology to, in order to be able to do it? Sure, um, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible because there's a, that's a story and a half. Um, so uh, with Render, like I mentioned, it's all about providing remote engagement uh, solutions for home improvement contractors, which like I said, have not existed. Um, if you think about if you've, uh, I don't know how many professionals are in this room that have remodeling companies, but even as a homeowner, if you think back about remodeling your home, the first thing that you have to do is uh, call contractors so that they can come out to your home, measure the space, and talk to you about what you'd like to have done, uh, which is an arduous process. I mean, uh, wastes a lot of time on the homeowner side and also wastes a lot of time on the construction uh, professional side as well. I mean, I know as, uh, with my remodeling company, you know, we have probably a 40 to 50% closing ratio with jobs that we go out and actually physically see. Uh, but that's, you know, better than most. I mean, I think the, uh, the traditional average in this industry is about 30%. So two thirds of all of a contractor's time is completely wasted by traveling, visiting people in homes and spending all that time to collect measurements. Um, in 2020, we shut down our company uh, for a few months. And uh, it was during those couple of months, we were getting calls. I mean, if you were like everybody else, I mean, everybody hated being stuck in their home for so long during COVID. And people started to understand a little bit more about how their home operated and how much they didn't like it. So they were reaching out wanting projects done, but you know there was no way for me to get into their homes. They didn't really feel comfortable having me come out. And so uh, we came up with this process to uh, have them send us photos uh, of the space that we would stitch together and come up with a floor plan, measurements and estimates. And um, it was a stopgap solution for us uh, which turned into a pretty um, vivid picture of what this industry could become, where uh, there have been innovations in other industries, health, food, retail, where you can buy things without stepping foot inside of a brick and mortar store. Uh, for home improvement professionals, there's literally no way to do that because you need measurements. You need to be able to provide them an accurate quote. Uh, well, we figured out how to get those measurements remotely. Uh, so we designed our own software that uh, allows us to invite a homeowner to scan a room with their phone and it generates floor plans and measurements, so elevations, uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, so to answer your last question, which is how do we figure out how to do that as uh, contractors, right? So we're not experts in this um, tech space by putting it nicely. Uh, 
It was, uh, for me, it was all about uh, channeling my inner Elon, um, as polarizing as he could be. Uh, let's put that aside, but really focus on, um, you know, he was an e-commerce, uh, e-finance kind of guy, and he wanted to send rocket ships to Mars. So what is the first thing that he does? Well, he has to become a rocket scientist. So he reads every book, networks with every rocket scientist, and he becomes an expert in what he has to become an expert in. And ultimately, for me, it was all about doing that, is, um, becoming an expert in literally the worst thing that I feel, sorry if there's any investors in the room, I do want to talk to you. Uh, but uh, just me learning everything there is to know about venture capitalists, uh, you know, that, that network and um, uh, network, network, network has been probably the biggest key for me. Uh, that's how I found our developers and uh, they've been phenomenal partners, capturing my vision for what I see that I need to have done. And of course, me as a contractor is like, I just needed to, I just needed to do this. I just, I just have to have it do this. And they're like, okay, well, we'll figure it out. And uh, having them come back to me, and you know, we're looking at bringing a lot of developers in house now. And now I can speak the language probably better than uh, most, but probably not as good as I need to be. But uh, you know, it's it's all about education, learning, networking, all of that. So, Kristen, you you made a comment that you're, it's hard. The digital transformation is hard. Is, is your focus um, mostly internal in terms of, of, of the uh, staff and contractors and whatnot, you know, at, at Whiting Turner, understanding the new technology that's coming out and how they need to employ it or deploy it? One or the, one or the other of those words is correct. <laughs> I'm an engineer. Sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think... Um, Internal first, but really, it's it's re well, it's really both um, because they're not going to do anything unless the client's asking for it. So you know, you know, try to because we're contractors, right? We got to keep our prices down. So, um, so it's it's kind of going twofold. One where we're trying to use it to our advantage, but knowing that it comes with a price, right? Um, but it's also talking about and coaching through that. Um, it's not as expensive as people think it is, right? Technology, and I'm sure everybody in the room hears is technology, so therefore it's expensive. We all have phones in our, you know what I mean? We all have phones in our pockets. We all have the computers we're using, all those things. Like this is, it's not above normal price now, but it's just they hear it and they think it's automatically expensive. Construction's an old industry, we all know this, right? And we all have ideas of how much things cost from whenever we were actually doing the thing, right? Um, so we're constantly fighting that, um, and industry, and you know, in a lot of companies and a lot of industries, um, th the way the structure is, the leaders have been around for a long time, and there's pride in what was what they've built, right? And how things were built is different from 30 years ago. It's much different than how we build now, right? I'm sure Chris sees it in training, and we all see it across the board. So we're fighting that against something that's thought of as a disruptor, something that's expensive, something that's different, right? Something's going to, um, and as we, a lot of us know in the room, it's not that we get a contract and we have, you know, a year to do something. So the contract, can we go? Why aren't you done? Why, let's go, 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 go. So there's no time in the schedule. So there's a lot of um, education that's happening in so many different spaces and it's internal and it's external and it's networking and it's just a lot of work. So um, that's why I was joking about job security, but like there's literally some space that you could be educating somebody that would like clear the path for what we're trying to do. Um, but it's in, so we also need like the hardware too. It's in, so it's not just like the idea of it, but then you also need to talk like, oh, it also comes though with hardware. It comes with software. It's a new computer, right? So there's the there's the investment, that initial investment, right? Where you know, I'm sure we all were like, do we need iPads ten years ago? I don't think so. Five years, but now everyone has an iPad, right? So there's all these things that we're chipping away at it. But construction's a very slow industry. It is very slow. You know, there's it's just it's just a big rock to push up that mountain. <laughs> Right, because people are still like pushing. Like, are you sure? Are you sure you need it? Because um, so I was a project manager. So I built. I was you know in the field for a while, um, building things and and switched over um, to doing this and kind of build this because we had zero people doing it um, nine years ago. So when I switched over, someone was like, ah, "You sure you want to do that? I think it's just a fad. Like it's not." So there's been so that is um, that is still a mentality that still exists that thinks that this is something that's um, is going to go away. And why I say it's also external is because um, I also did some outreach with um, COA, um, like nationally with one of their um, 
outreach things. What's, we, what's HOA? Oh, COA is, um, I actually have no idea. It's owners, it's <laughs> an owners association, uh, mostly health, uh, it's like the most higher education, <laughs> constructed, there we go. It's, but it's not a higher ed, a lot of campus, like people that own campus. Um, so thanks for putting me on the spot, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, yeah, I don't know, yeah, uh, I, didn't, I didn't do that research. Um, but why I'm saying it's still crazy is that uh, even the owners, like we were like, oh, we're gonna do a, um, do you wanna be educated? on BIM, VDC, 3D technology, all that stuff. And some of them were like, nah, we're good. We're not gonna do that. And you're like, you're a major campus. You're a major organization. Like, and they, all, in, in their minds, they feel that, um, that it's already passed. Like, they're, they're never gonna catch up, so like, I'm just not gonna do it. So like, they don't have requirements, they don't have standards. So people, so it's just disorganized. So that's why I'm saying it's internal, but then it's also so external, and there's not, that's why it's just this, Job security. It's just job security, really. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to say for that. <laughs> yeah. you, you mentioned hardware when you when you when you looked at Steve. So what, you know, how are how is Building Point transforming what it does based on the techno tech, advancements in technology? And maybe explain a little bit a little bit about you know what what, what Building Point actually is, what it does. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I haven't heard it's too expensive. It, like seven or eight times today. That was <laughs> that's probably it. Um, so just like technology in general, and, and my background is in construction technology. I came from the field, but gravitated towards the the technology side. And you know, as it stands today, I, I focus on software. I focus on hardware. I focus on services that that are all you know in that technical spectrum. Um, and by that I mean robotic total stations that are used to do layout, laser scanning that is collecting data for 3D modeling or further on down the road with BIM or um, workforce tracking on job sites or project management software that is, is as you had mentioned, with Procore. Um, you know, th that's the industry I work in. And what I see when I, when I talk to a lot of companies is just a lot of blank stares and a lot of confusion. And the best way I can like kind of sum that up is I feel like construction companies and owners and people that have been tasked with bringing technology into the space are standing in a room and everyone's screaming, everyone's screaming. And they are just like, someone just please be quiet and tell me which direction to go in. Um, you know, so that's, that's a takeaway that I think is important because as, as Kristen you know, had mentioned is th there's a lot of tech and there's a lot of owners driving initiatives and there's a lot of industry outside influences driving you know, decisions and it becomes very confusing and, and you start to trip up because you can't pick one lane and stay in it and focus. So while I am in the business of selling technology, I am more in the business of not letting companies make bad decisions because I'm in it for the long haul, not just selling something and moving on. So um, that, that's just something that, that I would leave you with is try to like cut down that noise. Don't try not to look at LinkedIn um, because there's a lot of technology companies out there pushing technology that isn't real. And by the time you figure it out, it's too late and, and now you had a bad experience. So, um, you know, that, that's not a total answer to your question. No, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting though that, you know, you, when you talk about there, there being a lot of noise um, in the room, um, and speaking um, from the viewpoint of, where's, where's Kimmy, a, di a tech dinosaur here, um, it, it, does, it does get noisy, but if, and I'll direct this to you, to you on, you know, how do you know there's all this, all these companies trying to sell you technology. You know, you've got Procore. Well, this is better than Procore. This is how. How do you? How does a company, particularly a small company, and, and you all aren't that small, but a company like yours, figure out? You know, what is there something better than what I'm using? And what kind of chances can you take on something? You think something's better than, than what you're using, but it's not quite there. I mean, is that is that something that you would go to an outside source to, to help you figure out? So a lot of time it actually comes in with the, the contract itself, right? So okay. owners will dictate what program they're used to, what, they're, what they want us to use and what they want us to buy for them as part of the project. So when I first was started with Mahogany, it was PlanGrid, which is another software-based pro um, program 
that has been since bought by Autodesk and has the same capabilities as Procore. You have your submittals, your RFIs, your daily log. So that was how we actually did a lot of things, but then it became Whiting Turner. I was doing, doing partners with Whiting Turner and Turner. Uh, Bart Mello, they're using Procore, so then we got, got used to using Procore. And it has the same capabilities, but it takes it a step further where it ties into our, our financial. So it's, you know, what, how, what capabilities do we need as a company to continue to grow? Does it just do one aspect well, or can it do a multiple, multiple things mediocre that we can get done at a certain point? So tying it with Steve, you know, like you said, it's a lot of things that keeps coming out here and trying to sell us what's better. Okay, you had, then it ties into estimating. You have a program called Build and Connect It. Another thing that ties into Plan Grid. Okay, that's great. I can use Plan Grid and Build and Connect It to get my estimates out and c compile my numbers but it doesn't then turn into an actual daily report or it ties into my financials the way I need to to actually allow the, uh, to go from pre-construction into after construction and from pre-construction into post-construction, which is turning the, over, turning the project over to the owner and then training them, right? And then even with Procore, I can actually tie into BIM and do, do my, I'm um, sorry, tie into BIM and actually read the model and go through the model as I'm building the project. I can't do that with Plan Grid, but Procore, I have the ability to do that even if I don't have BIM on my project, um, on my computer, or even have the capability to understand BIM. And I'm not a BIM guy. John Sargent right behind me, he's, the, he's my MEP guru. He understands more than I do. But Procore allows me to actually see what I'm, what I'm getting ready to build and understand the, the conflicts that are arising, bringing a window maybe off two inches, um, a sprinkler pipe, entering through a uh, cavity and the light tying over top of it. So it just gives me the ability. So it's, I mean, I think I hope that answers yeah, your question. No, that, no that's, that, that's interesting. And, and John Sargent, just because you're hiding behind the door doesn't mean I can't ask you a question. <laughs> why, why, why don't you have a seat right here? <laughs> I, John Sargent is the president at Mahogany. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so... Chris, we, we've heard four people now talk about education and training and trying to figure out what's best. And from your perspective, we, construction is one of those industries where there are a lot of unfilled jobs for lots of reasons, but, but it's challenged to find a skilled workforce in, in the construction trades and particularly in the trades. So how, how does the technology piece add another layer of challenge for organizations like, like yours and those that you're associated with to, to get a skilled workforce ready to take a job at any of these, any of these companies? All right, so I think the biggest challenge is that um, Kristen mentioned that it's just the, the industry moves really slow. Um, there's a psychological issue, right? Um, there's a cultural issue. And the psychological issue is that the owners of a lot of construction companies, they worked really hard to get where they're at, you know, and they expect their people to work really hard in the same way to get where they should be. Um, and it, it's, you have to, you know, their mind needs to change in the way they think. Um, so it's difficult for programs like ours because like the ABCs, the unions, you know, we're large organizations representing a lot of different types of people. So. I'm faced with it. I had a really good conversation with Chile over here with Be More Technology um, uh, before, before uh, earlier today, and we were just talking about um, it, it's just there's such a it has to be a perfect formula, right? Um, I have to be very um, conscious about how I talk about adding technology. Um, I have to tread lightly um, you know I have to be aware of who I'm talking to um, at the same time I have to be really quick to adapt to changes in the industry um, so that's one of the reasons why I said our training has just exploded over the past few years is because this facility has given us the opportunity to get creative with things uh, and then there's a challenge with funding so you know the the programs that we offer they have to be funding funded where are we going to get that funding from um so you're not just dealing with like the old school mentality of business owners but also the state where the funding comes from so a lot of the funding right now is geared towards getting uh people young people out of high schools into formal registered apprenticeship programs 
Um, you ask any 17 year or 18 year old whose frontal cortex isn't, isn't fully developed yet to be a plumber for the rest of their life, it's just not going to happen. So um, it, it's complicated. Like we rely on relationships with Jen and MCCEI. Like one of the things that I, I think that our organization does a little bit differently is I don't try to drive people to be plumbers or electricians or HVAC techs. Um, I, I feel like my responsibility is to tell them what a career in construction looks like. Um, so one of the issues we know is that, uh, one of, that we don't have a skilled workforce is that, um, or a shortage is that the high schools are not doing what they used to do 20 years ago. So there's no tech programs or CT programs like there, like there were. Um, so I started one two years ago, a trade school. Uh, I got a grant for it. It was an innovation grant through the state. Uh, and the goal of that was to get really innovative and creative with those students in ways we couldn't with traditional apprentices. So uh, teaching them um, some of the programs that we had mentioned here, um, showing them what, you know, how to operate a heavy equipment operating simulator. Um, one of those students that I met was, his name was Tommy Lubin. Um, and he had a lot of questions about the industry, right? Um, and we we told him what a career in construction looked like, from being a laborer to a skilled laborer uh, to owning his own business. And um, he was picked up by Cornerstone, you know, and he's knocking it out of the park right now. But, oh yeah, thank you, right? Um, it's a success story. I, you know, we wish we had tons of people like that come through our program, but... So do we. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it, I mean, it's it's a balancing act, um, and it's having the right people in the right place. Um, and I think that we we have it here. We have it with the support of our partners. Like collaboration is is huge. It's so important. We can't do it on our own. Um, and being able to. So we're, we're the third largest ABC in the country. I think I mentioned that. I think we have the fourth largest apprenticeship. So right now I have 500 apprentices. So you saw some of them as you came in. 500 students right now who are working for contractors during the day and they're attending classes at night. That's just apprenticeship. Um, and I want to throw out there too that Maryland right now has more registered apprentices than they've ever had in the history of the state. Yes, yet we still have a workforce shortage because contractors are starting to see uh, they're starting to feel the pain, right? So they're investing in their existing workforce. What we need is for people to come out of the school system, so more people get engaged on that front end. And I think um, part of it, again, just going back to being able to quickly adapt to new technologies, offer training programs like having heavy equipment operating simulators. I'm partnering with Earl Beck to do virtual welding. We're starting a building automation systems program in a couple weeks for HVAC. Nobody's doing that right now. Uh, and then talking about construction as a career, not a specific trade, and let young people make the decision for themselves. You mentioned MCCEI. Um, don't ask me what it stands for. I'm going to ask Jennifer Sproul, who is the head of MCCEI. Uh, and then we'll open up for other questions, but I really wanted you to have, to have a chance to explain what that organization is and how innovation and technologies basically changed how you go about what you do. So we're the Maryland Center for Construction Education and Innovation. Oh, thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, so Jen Sproul, uh, president of Maryland Center for Construction Education and Innovation. We're a nonprofit, um, 501 C3, founded in 2009 by many of the organizations in this room um, as a workforce intermediary to, between the education system, the government, and the industry as a way to figure out how we can fix our broken pipeline and get a diverse population into careers in the built environment. And like Chris said, our mission is not to push anybody, skilled trade versus architect versus engineer, but let kids know all of the opportunities that there are in the built environment because there's a million that we know of that even once you get into the industry, you're like, I didn't know that was a job. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty cool. And I do think the um, innovation that's happening in the industry is because of the workforce shortage, right? 
Say you spend $25,000 on a software program to automate HR. You need less HR people pushing those um, applications that are coming in and get people, um, get your HR person that you do have, hopefully you have one, um, actually getting people in, into, the, into the door and actually being a strategic partner in your hiring and firing um, needs. But then also, I think uh, the innovation is a way that we could recruit more people to the industry. Right now, everyone's hiring um, you know, civil engineers and um, architects and construction management kids. We should be looking at kids with IT backgrounds and, and that, and I don't think, I'm sure there are contractors doing that, but not many. And those are the types of kids we should be looking for because honestly, I think as an industry, we've done ourselves a disservice by saying that construction managers all need to have an engineering degree um, or something related to it because there aren't that many um, of those programs, especially here in Maryland. The only construction management degree in Maryland is in, at Morgan State and at UMES. No other degree in the state of Maryland for construction management. So, it, I mean, it's, we've created a problem of, as an industry, we need to be a little more, um, think outside the box. Uh, okay, I mean, I could ask questions for the entire next half hour, so, um, <laughs> but I won't. Um, so, yes, yes, sir, Mr. Mullen. Oh, 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 sorry. I know that you can hear, but we're recording it, so we want to be able to actually hear it. Sure. So you got 500. How do we get you to 1,000? So the Baltimore Robotics Center works with kids that do competitive robotics in Baltimore City. There's over 100 robotics teams in Baltimore City. And last weekend, 200 of those kids were in a gym on Northern Parkway. And those kids are looking for jobs. The robotics center is across the street from Mahogany on Pratt Street. How do we get you guys to walk across the street and meet the kids? Oh, here you go. And I'll ask the other question. I'm not seeing anybody in the room from Baltimore City Public Schools. And I know they're very interested in doing CTE programs with the employers, because the new Kerwin rules make it very important to them to have kids in high school, like we used to do back in the day, doing work study, going at 2.30 over to an employer and actually doing construction. So as a group, I don't mean in a bad way, I'm like, how can we make these connections and pull it all together? Well. The quick answer is you and I get together after this and have a conversation and I'll come across the street. I think the challenge, you know, going from a high school technical um, background such as robotics, I think the challenge, and I think it's one of the things we're sort of going to end up having to bridge here, the challenge we run into is how to find a balance between old school knowledge and new technology. There are a lot of people in the industry who know how to build stuff. They understand the nuts and bolts of building stuff. They're interested in building stuff. They're not usually very good at the technology. And then you have a new group of people that is very embracing of the technology, but truth be told, they need to be told what they're building and what they're drawing. And how you bridge that gap, how you create that, you know, that, that connection between the people that can control the technology and the people that have that knowledge that we are losing, essentially, as a culture, it's really about giving them the space to work together. That's what we always try to do. We literally create teams where we say, this is a person who really knows how to build something, and I'm gonna put him with a person that really knows how to run that computer, and we force them in the same room together. And I think at the end of the day, it's a great idea. The challenge we face as a general contractor, <clears throat> that's two people doing one job. That costs more money. So the funding, to enable this to happen, I think is part of the challenge that we're facing. I mean, to, to your point, um, as someone that provides technology to help supplement 
labor shortages, right? The, what, what I'm constantly preaching is we're not here to replace people. We are here to free up skilled labor so they can focus on skilled tasks and take somebody, as you, as you mentioned, that's maybe entry level that has a passion for technology to fill that seat and let the two of them work together as opposed to tying up skilled labor to do something that, as you said, they don't want to do, most of them. Um, could, so. But could you have both in one person? Can, can you have, I mean, is that the goal to have a skilled person that has also has been able to acquire the technology understand it? I think the kids today would call that the unicorn, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. The, 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 okay. There are people out there who have kind of bridged that gap and, 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 it's, and it's great to find. It is not the norm. That, that, I, that I personally see. But the barrier that I'm seeing to technology in a lot of areas is not having the people to do it. So companies are like, if once I get the person that I can have operate or use this technology or, or own this piece of technology, then we'll do it. So like we're almost like restricting our own growth like in that technology world. Yes. Oh, here. I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> no, no, we got plenty of mics out here, it's all right. <laughs> So thank you for having me. I, um, I can attest to the notion that implementation is hard and that you have to know your audience. So I'm the founder and CEO at Femly. It's a tech company that creates smart feminine hygiene dispensers where women walk up, wave hello, and get free feminine care in restrooms. I have the obstacle of talking to like really old, stale people who are like dead against change and construction, but then also like screaming vagina in meetings. <laughs> so one of the things that I have found as a non-technical founder who was one of the first 100 black women in the history of the US to be venture backed was that language is a barrier. Um, no, it's a quite an accomplishment. It is, and it's hard as hell. But um, language is a barrier. So like, from having investment and funding conversations to potential commercial partners and like people in real estate tech and property tech, I have found it impactful to almost dumb it down in a way that makes it palatable and digestible for anybody. If you are in tech, I can tell you that like, hey, we have an AI powered dispenser that's using multi-sensor technology. But if you are Bob with a legacy construction business, you might just know that we have a really pretty box that's like gorgeous as hell and gives free pads and tampons. How do you feel that providers like myself who aren't in construction but are construction adjacent can support you all in the efforts that you are doing in technology and development and beyond? So I, will, I have a, just a quick, quick story with that. So um, because I'm also, I'm always trying to, I try to find a example right, where they, they can't say no to it, right? So a big thing for what I say, because and I know I said digital transformation, right? So I, I live my day, um, well, I have an incredible team. I don't do anything, but my, my incredible team, <laughs> my incredible team of over 100 people um, nationally, um, they're fabulous, but what I'm, is we talk about what, how it's going to help them. So we talk a lot about, but then try to make how it's helping them in a palatable space. So saying like, you like efficiency, right? You like all these things, right? And then saying, you know, um, when you went to work today, did you plug in Google Maps? Did you put your maps, right? I put it to get here. I do it to go to work every day. I know where I'm going, right? But I still plug it into Google Maps because I don't want to sit in traffic, right? It's usually 22 minutes. If it gets me 24 minutes, I'm going to lose it, right? <laughs> right? We all do it. So I say, but, so the model space that we create, right, in BIM and 3D modeling, right, it's literally Google Maps for building. It's what it is, right? We're gonna find all the problems and then we're not gonna sit in the traffic and we're just gonna get it done and it's not gonna be an issue, right? So I just try to compare, at least it's, and it, and it gets it, right? It gets them and then we talk about, you know, the cost and all the other stuff that goes along with it. But at least to get them to hear me, I gotta start with something that's like so simple. And to me, I found that like that comparison for me is a big one. And it's I'm familiar like, to them. It's because it's familiar. And it talks about efficiency and something like, don't, why would you sit in the traffic but you're gonna um, not use a model for something that will save five, 10, 15, $25,000? Because what change order is less than $5,000? I'd love to know, you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's, what, that's, what's worked, that's what's worked for me. I think too, um, you know, because we're in a early stage growth. You, you're probably very familiar. You have 
different stories to sell to different people, right? So we're, we're selling this idea, this vision, uh, making it palatable for an investor to understand exactly uh, the nuts and bolts of what we do. Uh, for, we're fortunate enough to have like a very relatable story. Like the first thing I asked you guys is, have you ever remodeled part of your home? It's an easy one to like, oh yeah, I have. I can relate to the pain that I experienced with that. Uh, for us, selling this vision both to investors, but also to, you know, potential enterprise clients and, you know, the the Chuck and a Chuck uh, that you were ex- explaining. Um, <laughs> Chuck and a Chuck is who we dub him. Uh, so when we're selling to Chuck, it's a different, you know, we, we um, change the, the story a little bit and make it relatable. We, we, talk, we talked this week about our sales message and um, and this answer, this is a twofold answer. So one is changing our sales message to focusing on the use case. Like one of the first things we find out about them is like, what do you, what do, you do? Like what is your expertise? And... Um, how do you operate? How do you get measurements from a project? How, how do you answer that initial sales call? How much time do you spend on that? Like having the, uh, the customer or the decision maker, the business owner, uh, identify with that pain all, all automatically. There's all this, uh, disposition that they have like, ah, yeah, I don't like that. Well, would you like to do that better? Because this is what we offer, and we can do that a ton times better. We talk about adding efficiency, you know, not making technology replace people per se, but helping making them more efficient. You know, uh, especially with a labor shortage, we need two people to do the job of ten. And when you find that uh, that that magic thing that makes two people do the work of ten, it's uh, it's a disruptor. You know, the pneumatic nail gun came on the scene, and where it took two weeks to frame a basement, now it takes two days. That's efficiency that business owners can get behind, no matter what, uh, no matter where they stand on the generational spectrum. Because I feel like that's a lot of what we talk about is when we're trying to, uh, you know, convince business owners to adopt new technology for their for the company. We are talking about the construction, this very archaic, uh, brick and mortar, hands dirty, um, bootstrap kind of industry where. Um, when you're talking to these, you know, older, uh, older generational guys that you know are the ones with the experience, but I have worked this hard my entire career to get to where I am. Like, why is this not good enough? Well, it's not, we're not saying that it's not good enough, but you have a lot of younger guys underneath of you who don't who don't see the same value, and it's not like it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's just. Uh, these younger generations, uh, millennials, I'm a millennial, uh, and Gen Z, they, they prioritize different things about their career. And instead of just being against that, embrace that. Make it something where you have these younger generations coming into uh, this space. We need that. We need these younger generations to come in and fill these labor shortages. So why not make your business operate a little bit more? As, it's, it's a changing tide. You know, we're, we're seeing a generational shift. It's actually easier for us to sell what we offer to contractors because we are seeing that generational shift and we want to be on that we want to be on that front edge you know we don't want to be the guys that are like it's too hard to sell this technology to people it's too hard all these people don't want to you know all these guys are the older they're setting their ways but what happens in 10 years when those guys don't exist to your point there were two things that happened that were the difference between traction and 25 million in pipeline it was one the fact that there are 63 laws right now saying you can't charge students for feminine care, so we got a lot of schools and colleges. And two, it was framing the value proposition from like pink frilly feminine care to remote inventory management, where we have a dashboard that tells you how many products are in the dispenser. But I think you're right, and it definitely is a niche conversation that you have to alter. And uh, not to hog the, uh, the scene here, but uh, backing on what you said earlier too, is that um, when you're selling software to a particular industry, um, uh, when you can touch all various points of that ecosystem too, um, where you have one program that does this really well, but does it make my life easier when I'm working in eight different softwares? Like if I use QuickBooks and I use CoConstruct and I use my CAD software, like is there one software I'm introducing now a whole nother one that someone has to learn? Well, if we make that software easier for the contractor, like it plugs into this, it plugs into this. You don't have to relearn your CRM. You don't have to relearn your project management software. It's all about playing with the, the entire, understanding the ecosystem around you and making it easy for a contractor to adopt that new technology too. Are there other uh, questions? Thought I have thought a hand up there. So hi there, my name is Bianca Jackson and I am the Chief Metaverse Officer at my company. And so this conversation is very- You say Chief Metaverse? I, yes, Chief I, Metaverse well, Officer. Well, we'll talk later. I don't know what the Metaverse is. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't. So I'm actually probably the only black woman on the planet with a post surprise in virtual reality. 
And so I'm here because this conversation is really interesting. We've actually, we are the unicorn that a lot of you are looking for. We built structures in the metaverse. One we're working on next week, which is a concert venue. So it kind of gives you an idea of where the future is going. So I guess my question is, how can we support what you're doing? Because you're talking about 3D models, but the future of 3D models are actually digital and virtual neighborhoods where multiple people can actually be in and, and, and engage and communicate. So how can we support your efforts? You want me to answer? You want me to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do know what 3D modeling is. So I, 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 I'll, give, I'll give you that much. I, I'll say from my perspective there, we, we have a technology that is mixed reality, right? And it's taking the model into the space and being able to visualize, you know, what's going to happen or what could happen. And I think it's a little ahead of, the, ahead of its time currently right now, to be honest with you. Um, we do see traction with it, but to everyone's points, this, this is such a slow churn that, that we're, we're just climbing the hill with technology in a lot of ways. And I, I do believe it, it, it does catch up. And the minute someone puts it on and can visualize it and see it, the impact is pretty powerful. But getting wide adoption is, is a challenge. So. Right now we have yeah, that's, like, yeah. that's easy. That's easy. That's, that's easy. <laughs> okay, that's so easy. my question was um, the ability to render my dispenser installation before it goes in so that like a school knows if it's functional and fits. Um, but yeah, happy to talk after. So that's that's pretty easy. That's that's what we do in BIM. That's right. building information modeling. So we take the information that you give us, put it into the model, and, and it shows up right where it's supposed to be. We can see the size of it. We can see how big it is. We can see how it's going to interact with the other systems that are in the building. Um, but but to your point, um, so I'm a photographer part time as well, right? So. And photography is going into the construction real estate portion. And if you look when you're doing um, at Zillow or Redfin, you're seeing these houses in real life time. In, in a 3D in a 3D model, you can walk around. You can touch. You can almost touch it. On the on our side, it's not necessarily at that point just yet. Like you mentioned, it's a slow turning kind of situation. Owners can with BIM, you can see it finished, but it's not necessarily a full on model where you actually can walk through it and touch it and see it in real life, in the real life condition like you see it now. It's a completely different situation. So I think where it, when we can get to that point uh, that we have that metaverse situation where I can actually touch that model and I can give it to Michelle or Chris or, or you before I even have that building there, it'll, it'll, it'll transcend everything. But it's, like you said, it's slow. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, so we, a recent project we were going after, it, it was a, a hospital. I'm not going to name the hospital. I think some other people were probably going after it as well. <laughs> and we were talking about a selling point, right? Like, what's the selling point? We have BIM. We had a 3D model uh, aspect to the project. It was a requirement. And we were trying to sell the client on a headset. Like, all right, once we create the model, we are going to give you a virtual headset and you're going to have the ability to basically walk through your space. One of the challenges with BIM that I've experienced is the people who, once the job is done, walk into the job and complain about where everything is, are not willing to actually use the model to look at it in advance. So you go through a lot of effort and you create a model, but the same people who really need to approve the final product are not willing to walk through it. That's generational. That is totally generational. Well, I'll, I'll also say to that, though. I would walk, I totally would walk through it. Okay. Yeah. But I would, I would also say sometimes, and this is where the complexity of all this is, is sometimes those people aren't invited to even participate because the funding of the project is capital funding, right? So it's Correct. it's different dollars. So the people that are on the operations side, they keep them out because they know that the operations folks are gonna make it more expensive because they're gonna have more comments about access and all that stuff. So it's like not all the right people are in the room because exactly. they're so worried about the money of the upfront, the 20% versus the 80%, right? So it's, it's, it's just broken. Which is why we try to use Procore to invite everybody on the job <laughs> all at the same time. But but to your point, it, it is a challenge and there's a relationship there definitely between what I think you do. Now, with BIM, 
at the end of the day, the whole purpose of the model is to be able to bring it back into the real world. Like if you can't bring it back into the real, like that's the whole purpose. That's the reason that we scan, that's the reason that we model, and that's the reason that we try to show somebody how to bring it back into the real world. Um, there is an integration going on there, and it has to do with the headsets. <laughs> so the technology we use, you can use the headsets, you can use your laptop, and you can use a phone to view these spaces. So the barrier to entry is coming down, and it's coming down fast. Yeah, we went from having to use a Microsoft HoloLens to now holding an iPad or your phone up against the wall and being able to visualize it. It knocked that barrier down because the headset was... I just want to mention that um, I used to be at Barton Mallow, and... We did a lot of sports arenas, and they were they were building a, a new um, college football arena, and we're trying to sell um, season tickets. So what they did, what we offered to sell to Barton Mallow is, I mean, to the to the college, um, we will put the three D model, but not a much nicer version of the three D model where it actually looked like the stadium, and we will um, make these the Google cardboards. Um, logoed for your school and everything, and they sent that with a link to the model to all of them to to say this is what your seat would look like. I mean, that was it was a way that they won the project because of that, but also just showing the, how the how they could pay for the technology that we were already gonna wanted to use, but actually make it like worthwhile to the owner. So um, I've got a question for Chris. Here, hearing. To talk about, well, you had robotics um, and the metaverse and et cetera, et cetera. The, is that a way to attract more young people into an industry that's looked at by young people as dirty, grimy, low paying, et cetera, that, wait a minute, you know, are you interested in robotics? Well, guess what's, what robotics is doing in the construction industry, or, or you know, do you even know what the metaverse is? If you do, you may, you know, there, there's these things. Is that a way, is that a way of, a, of getting to that whole workforce piece so that you are, you are getting to, beginning to have that skilled labor person along with the, the, the technology, techno-savvy person? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And how we've been talking about like a barrier to entrance to technology, that breaks down the barrier to entrance to the construction industry because they're so used to it, right? So, um, you know, we're exploring projects with, I had mentioned, uh, we're starting a building automation system program for entry level um, HVAC techs who might want to get on the control side of thing and control entire buildings. Um, nobody's doing that right now. We're gonna be the, uh, it's gonna be the first program of its kind in the region. Uh, we, we have heavy equipment operating simulators, which you'll all see, um, so that's, when I do, um, so I'm doing internships with some of the GCs um, locally, and we always end with that because they love it, right? All, all the middle schools or high school tours we do, we end with that because we want, that's what they, they're going to remember. Um, it's cool to them. It's easy to them. It's, it makes sense. Um, and that kind of starts breaking down that stigma that they have in the industry. So I'm really looking to partner with organizations and companies and startups who are interested in this, especially on the training side of construction, to see how we can work together. If somebody's working on, whether it's a piece of software, a program, or whatever, that they think would be applicable to the construction industry, how, how do you make that connection? Is it the investors who help to make that connection? I mean, you know, if, I, if I have this, this, great, this great program I'm working on, and I know it's going to transform the construction industry, how do I get it out there? Any... So you would start with investors. Um, if they're a value-added investor or a VC, traditionally they'll have larger scale um, 
introductions. For instance, when I designed my dispenser, I did it in 2020 at a time where the world was shut down. But the minute we kind of put it into the world, it went viral. And I ended up bringing on two major VC investors who then introduced me to partners like CBRE, Health Systems, T. Rowe Price was amazing in giving us um, supplier diversity for their locations. And then this fabulous woman next to me introduced me to the head of supplier diversity at Cushman Wakefield. So um, traditionally, it's going to be your angel investors or funders that make those connections for you. But I have found, being a New Yorker, I have found Baltimore to be super gritty and that I could show up in like a messy bun and leggings and close a million dollar deal. Um, I also think the other thing that's cool about this region specifically is that everyone that you could ever want to connect with is literally one degree away and everyone's always willing to help. And I'll compound that by saying that, um, you know, some of the most exciting things that happen in your life are because you let a simple conversation happen. So again, network, network, network. Uh, investors have been key for us. Um, bringing in strategic advisors uh, in areas that you're not as well versed in uh, is another one for us. Um, but one of the most exciting things that happened for us was... Um, one of our, uh, you know, founding investors uh, was talking with his accountant about the investment he made, and uh, the accountant just dropped a line and says, "Oh, one of my other clients uh, had a successful startups, and that's pretty cool that you're doing that." Uh, Eric told me the story to encourage me, like, "Hey, it can be done," you know, uh, and I'm like. Can you, can you connect me with that guy? Can you ask the accountant if he can connect? And you know, all of a sudden, I connect with this guy at Starbucks, and uh, as befitting as it was, we were sitting right across the street from a Home Depot, and he kind of turned around and looked at Home Depot and said, that could be one of your acquisition targets. I'm like, well, it is. And uh, now Joe is our chief strategy officer and has connected us with uh, the world of investing in startups and C-Corp conversions and uh, partnered us with a uh, particular legal uh, advice, so uh, network, uh, but never be afraid to have that conversation. If you've got an idea that you think is going to disrupt the industry, start poking holes. It's product market fit is number one. You got to prove it. Uh, and then network with literally everyone. And when you're an introvert like me, uh, it's exhausting to do that. Yes, tour, tour, tour. Uh, so yeah, so if, if you all have time, um, it'll take about 15 minutes, and I'd love to just give you a tour of the facility. Is there any other questions? I, sorry, I didn't want to cut that off real fast, but I'm ready for the tour. Who's ready? <laughs> Thank you guys Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. I think we're just going to kind of meet right over here. Yeah. Yeah. At ease, man. Uh, this General Wilson is the control center uh, tracking room where we 